Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub. Welcome to part two of a fascinating conversation with now two friends of mine who sit across this table, Sergeant Benjamin Anthony, Brigadier General Amir Avivi. Both of them are part of a new organization called the New State Solution. And we've been discussing the viability of it as an alternative to both the two-state solution and the one-state solution. And I want to show you a video of what their idea is and then we're going to pick up the conversation. Here's the video on the new state solution. Some men see things as they are and say why. I dream things that never were and say why not. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is often perceived as an intractable deadlock, marked by decades of failed attempts to broker peace. Why does this conflict persist, considering Israel brokered enduring peace deals with Egypt and Jordan, ending decades of hostility? Historically, two dominant alternatives have been promoted for this region, but both were flawed and met only with failure, the two-state solution. This paradigm proposes an Israeli withdrawal to behind the 1949 armistice line in order to create the space for an independent Palestinian state in the area vacated. But such a plan would dramatically weaken Israel's ability to defend itself by leaving it with a nine-mile waistline, placing its main population centers at a topographical disadvantage which could easily be exploited by terrorists or foreign militaries. This plan would also require the relocation of hundreds of thousands of Israelis currently residing in communities in the West Bank. And the two-state paradigm offers no solution to the urgent challenges emanating from the Gaza Strip which have implications not only for the state of Israel, but for the Gazan people themselves. The Palestinian state would be divided between Gaza and a landlocked West Bank. Making the two contiguous would bifurcate Israel north from south. The one-state solution. This paradigm proposes that Israel unilaterally annex the West Bank and grant citizenship to all its Arab inhabitants. But this plan would involve imposing Israeli citizenship on Palestinian Arabs and therefore would likely increase antagonism as well as create a negative international response. And the demographic shift would dramatically affect and potentially destroy the character of the State of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. But the significant flaws in both solutions do not mean that the region is doomed to endless cycles of conflict. Neither people should have to accept that as their fate. It's time to talk about the new state solution. By merging the Gaza Strip with a repurposed portion of the Sinai Peninsula, a new, thriving, independent, sovereign and viable state can be created for all Palestinians. Egypt and Israel could guarantee respect for and defense of the borders of the new state. Israel, willing Arab nations and the international community could invest in the development of the new Palestinian state and Egypt as the donor state. Technological and logistical support in areas such as water and agriculture could make this desert bloom. The new state's Mediterranean coastline would offer rich opportunities for trade, commerce and tourism. The new state would affix its own migration policy so that anyone wishing to voluntarily relocate there would receive generous absorption and economic packages, setting them and their families on a pathway toward a far brighter future.
Israel would retain defensible borders that would not put it at risk and would preserve its Jewish and democratic character. The Palestinians would have a state with a single, contiguous territory within stable and recognized borders, with room for population growth, economic prosperity, and national pride. The forced transfer of any population of either peoples would be avoided. Applying new thinking instead of old slogans could add to the legacy of audacious diplomacy between Israel and her Arab neighbors and usher in a new era of peace and prosperity for all in the region. Some men see things as they are and say why. I dream things that never were and say why not. A video on the new state solution. And again, I hope by now you know Benjamin Anthony, who has been here so often on JBS, and we cover his marvelous programs that he produces for Our Soldier Speak, for which he is the founder. And you're still the director, correct? Yes. 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 And uh, I've said often, there are few people in this Jewish world who are as articulate and thoughtful and lovely as Benjamin Anthony. It's always wonderful to have you at this table. Thank you very, Thank much. You very, very Thank much. You. And my new friend, Amir Avivi, a Brigadier General in the IDF Reserves, who brings more than 30 years of military and national defense experience to his work with the new state solution. And it is lovely to have you back as well. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you very Pleasure. much. When we stopped, I had asked the two of you, as lovely as an idea as the new state solution might be, and it looks to me like it would be very, it would be wonderful for the Israeli people. I didn't see how the Palestinian community would want to adopt it because it would mean that they would have to virtually give up everything they've been fighting for for more than a hundred years. The Palestinians argue, the Palestinian leadership argues, the jihadist Muslim movement argues that Palestine became Muslim territory and that no infidel, especially a Jewish infidel, should have any sovereignty anywhere in that region. And that the claim is the Jews came from Europe after you know, the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, but then really after the Shoah, after the Holocaust. And Jews came and they took a land. They stole a land. They stole Palestinian land. They took Palestinian homes. And again, I've mentioned this time and time again because it played such an important role in the American Jewish psyche. Ari Shavit writes, My Promised Land. He actually starts by saying his, I think it's either his grandfather or great grandfather, I can't remember which one, was on a uh, trip to Israel on behalf of Theodore Herzl to see whether this land of Palestine could be a home for the Jews. And he, he, he was enthused and so excited. And what Ari Shavit writes is, he didn't see that there was a real people there. He was so enamored, so taken, he didn't see a people there. And had he seen, Ari Shavit writes, he would have turned back. That's the mentality we hear on the liberal end of the American Jewish community. And um, here I think we hear it also on the Israeli left. And the Palestinian has argued, you've taken my land. I've got a key to a house that you're in. I want my house back. And at the moment, the world community seems to go along with this insane notion that sites which are historically, quintessentially Jewish in history, can be renamed with Muslim names as if they don't have any connection to Jewish history. That's the United Nations. That's Western Europe. And so you come along and you say, look, let's create a Ghana Eden for the Palestinian community on the Mediterranean Sea. We can build a fabulous economic, cultural, social set for them. They can have everything they want in terms of national self-identity and self-expression. At the same time, the Jews will maintain Eretz Yisrael at both sides of the Green Line. The West Bank, Judea, Samaria will be part of Israel. No Israelis have to leave. No Palestinians have to leave. 
any Palestinian that wants to live, I assume, under Israeli sovereignty will have the right to do that on uh, Judea, Samaria, the West Bank. And everyone will live happily ever after, and including the fact that the Palestinians will give up any claim on East Jerusalem, which we spent a lot of time on our last show. My reaction is, I can't imagine the Palestinian leadership buying into your notion for one second. Tell me why I'm wrong. First of all, I think you will agree with me that history always tends to surprise us. Historical events happen, and people not only are surprised, they're many times shocked by events that happen. Now, events always, always happen according to real interests. So if you are surprised, it means you didn't see the shift of interest, and you don't understand what's going on. Now, the Palestinians for many, many years were an asset to the Arab world in their fight against Israel in order to legitimize the right of the Jewish people on Eretz Israel. But now, things have changed. And this present day, the Palestinians have become a liability for the Sunni Arab world. They want this problem out of the table because now a much bigger problem emerged and they need Israel in order to cope with it, and this is Iran. The Middle East is in a huge fight between Sunnis and Shias, Iranians leading the Shias, Saudi Arabia and Egypt leading the Sunnis. And in this fight, the Arab world has realized that the only real allies they have, the only ones they can depend on in this fight, is the state of Israel. And we are living in a new era. It's the first time in history that Israel and the Arab world have a common interest. This changes everything. And this is why we believe there is a chance that the Sunni Arab world who has lost interest in the Palestinian conflict and wants to get close to Israel will go along with an idea that benefits Palestinians dramatically, but also benefits Israel. We see in the Western world a lot of traction to this idea, and we believe that we can convince the American administration and the Europeans to support this idea, because in the liberal world it's not about religion. The real religion is solving conflicts. And this is a very reasonable way to solve this conflict. Are you saying that the Arab world is going to force the Palestinian to accept the new state solution? I'm saying that if we assess what is the source of strength of the Palestinian leaders, I think that the, the source of strength is the fact that they are being backed up all the time by the Arab world and the Western world. But I'm saying that things are changing. And people are willing now, because of new interests, because of a new situation, to reassess this uh, issue and not necessarily back up automatically the Palestinians. OK. I find it a fascinating analysis. By the way, I wouldn't use the word force. I would use the word facilitate, which is a very, very different connotation. They might facilitate the establishment of this state. We don't talk about the forcing of anybody. What does facilitate mean in the real world? Facilitation would look, for example, like funding, like the appropriation of the land, like giving the international imprimatur from numerous Arab states to the Palestinians to have the right to enter into an agreement, like building up the infrastructure in the real world. That's exactly what we talk about. Facilitation would look like that. Would someone like Abbas have to be replaced for this to happen? I don't say that he would have to be replaced, but I, I think it's a flawed idea to look at a man who's 85 years of age as being the individual who's going to carry a generational shift forward. Yes, I, I think understand. that's a mistake. Okay. Um, and I'm not dodging that, I'm okay. answering it directly. Do, you, do either of you, do you know personally, or do you know through the information you have, the people who are standing behind a bus to take over when he's done? I keep asking myself, and I'm as a, I want to be optimistic, 
And I said in the open to the last show, I don't care how dim the prospects are. The Jew and the Israeli always will strive for peace. But I want to see some evidence that it's not just wishful thinking. I want to see a peace now. I want to see a Palestinian Shalom Akshav. I want to see a Palestinian intellectual write a piece in the op-ed section of the New York Times blasting the Palestinian leadership for not being more open to some of the ideas that you've been expressing. I, I want to see some real, some, some mamash here in the yeah. Palestinian world that indicates to me that it's not just wishful thinking. So I'm asking you, when you say, you, of course, uh, Abbas has already t been there too long, but do you know of anybody behind him that may make this possible? I wouldn't like to speak about specific individuals. Why not? Why not? Why, Why not? don't you give me three names? Because it might endanger them at this present As long day. as that's true, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, but I, I want to I tell you. I hear this all the time. Yes. A lot of people, are, but they won't give their names, they won't go public. Mm -hmm. As long as that's true, to me it means nothing. Okay, I, I'll tell you how I see things. I don't think that the Palestinians uh, will become the next John Lennon and talk about <laughs> world peace. Okay? <laughs> But again, I'm looking at real interests. And the way I, th I think should be, things should be done in order to help the Palestinians decide they support this idea is first of all understand that the greatest interest uh, the Palestinian Authority has, they want status quo. They want status quo because they're getting a lot of money for nothing. They have no accountability. The IDF is looking after them, taking care of Hamas. That's a good situation for them. So our suggestion to the American administration is, and by the way, my, one of my passions is the uh, theory of gaming and how to apply it in policy. And I'm saying let's change the game. No more status quo anyway. And if the Western world understands that this is the best and right solution, it should, it's, they should try to say to the Palestinians, listen, friends, this is a great solution for you. It's a great solution for Israel. We are going to implement this solution. You have two choices. You can go along. and This will be a huge win-win for both sides. But if you don't, Israel will get his part of this solution. That's the force, by the way. That's the word force. It's either or. That's force. That's not facilitate. It's not force. Sure it's, it is. It's not. It's you inducement. Say, you say either or to somebody. Mm -hmm. There's a club. No, no, but that's, that's not force, and it's definitely not the force that you alluded to. You alluded to the forcing of the Palestinians to What I heard this. him say was, but in the, context the Western the, world will say to the, to the Palestinians, you, you were either about, or. Right. Now, you were speaking about the context of the Arab world, as I recall your question, and yes, I simply either, corrected that, oh, oh, that So that it's the not Arab the Arab world, world that will force, it, it's yes. the Western world that will force. No, no, I've, I've, been, I've said what I've said. Yeah, and you don't believe anybody's going to force. I don't, no. Okay. I don't. I think oh, what people I, can do I is hope, facilitate I hope you're right, but it's not not what the general just said. Okay, but I, I, I don't think the general at any point spoke about forcing anyone. I think you inferred that, but I don't think that's what he said. What does either or mean? I think it's the options. I think these are the options on the table. By the way, speaking of mamash, and I, I really, I, I completely share your view on this point. And it's sad and it's tragic that these voices are not audible, that we're told to believe that they're there and that and I understand that, and I think probably both theories are correct on that. But there has been some interesting movement. For example, the Saudis have spoken to the idea that the Palestinians now at this stage should accept what they are presented. Mm -hmm. That's historic. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've sort of started to look at these things and, and to discard them. I think that's a tremendous sea change in the language of the, of the Arab world, of, 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 of the uh, Saudi Arabian Kingdom. And it shouldn't just be skirted over. It mm -hmm. should be acknowledged for what it is. Now, with that, needs to be a request for facilitation. You're telling us to do it. What are you putting on the table so that we can have okay. it? Okay. One more question for you, and then I want you to answer the same question. <laughs> okay. Does the Palestinian care as much about Jerusalem? And I'm using Jerusalem now as a symbol. Does the Palestinian care as much about Jerusalem and 
what he believes is his home as much as the Jew believes Jerusalem is his home? Well, again, let's resort to history. And the Muslims have been holding and occupying this land for a long time. And during 2,000 of years, Jerusalem was completely neglected, remained within the walls, a poor and forgotten city. And when the Muslims needed to decide which city will be the capital of this province that was named by the Romans at the time, Palestina, they didn't think Jerusalem was important enough, and therefore they built a new city known as Ramle, not far, for, not far from where uh, Benjamin lives today in Israel. So I, I must say I'm not buying it. And I, and I don't think they care about Jerusalem as much as we do. Jerusalem is not mentioned even once in the Quran. And uh, therefore, I see, I, I'm not surprised but what but Benjamin said before about the reaction, about moving the embassy and recognizing it as Israel. Uh, I thought it was a very important comment that very often gets missed. Again, I, when I said Jerusalem, I don't necessarily mean Jerusalem, <clears throat> the confines of a city. Does the Palestinian feel that the land that we call Eretz Yisrael is his, or not really? Well, I'm not sure. I think that the, the, the way they're educated, especially in Gaza, uh, they're being incited from the age of zero uh, to believe that everything is theirs. And I'm saying again, if this is a zero-sum game, okay, we'll fight for, for our land, and, and we're winning, and we'll win. And we're trying to get out of this equation because yes. if we look at it from the Jewish point of view, Eretz Israel is ours, all of it. If we look at it from the Palestinian point of view, they say it's ours. Okay, we understood that. This is a zero-sum game. Now let's put it aside and let's find a viable solution. And the fact that everybody agrees that Gaza is a catastrophe, everybody agrees that Gaza needs attention, this is the one point that brings everyone together, and we need to think about Gaza. Now, when people support Oslo and feel that they're really being generous to the Palestinians, let's see what they're supporting. They're supporting an idea that leaves two million people in Gaza and trapped in, a, in an area of three and a half miles forever, for the next 2,000 years. This is not viable. Why should they accept it? Nobody would accept such a solution. So before we talk about the Palestinians in the West Bank, let's focus for a moment on Gaza and understand that Gaza, is, it's not possible to solve the situation there in such a small area. This area needs to thrive. It needs to grow. So there is a possibility to first of all build a viable contiguous state in this area of Gaza and the northern part of the Sinai Peninsula. And once the Palestinians have a viable state, I think that the whole issue of the West Bank, even if you for a moment put it aside and say, let's deal with it later. By the way, Oslo did the same thing. It said Gaza, Gaza first, Gaza and Jericho first. Let's start with Gaza. Let's build a real state, a real one. And then you'll see, and we see it even when we speak to people, the moment they understand the idea, the whole way of looking at Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, it changes completely at that moment. And then it brings you a lot of opportunities of how to solve specifically the issue of the Palestinians living in the West Bank. Whom have you talked to who's been excited about the idea the way you just described it to me? So <clears throat> a, couple of, a couple of points about that. Before I do, I, I, I do want to bring this conversation home about the Palestinians. And I, and I want to actually urge you and, and those who uh, ascribe to what you've put forward to, to consider what I'm saying. You don't have to agree, but I ask you to consider it. When we speak about the Palestinians, you phrased your question again, do the, the Palestinians want Jerusalem the same way the Jews want Jerusalem? And I understand it. I think that if we're going to tar everybody with the same brush or paint in such broad strokes, I, I think we're condemning both peoples to an endless cycle of violence. Because the reality is that some Palestinians do 
feel for Jerusalem what some Jews feel for Jerusalem. There are other Jews who do not feel that much for Jerusalem. There are other Palestinians who do not feel that much for Jerusalem. And I, w I want to give you a, a quick example, and then I will talk about who we've presented to and who has responded to this idea. So, look, I, I'm one of seven children. You already know that. Uh, around my dinner table, if I look at my childhood, as we all grew up, uh, there are four of the siblings who moved to the state of Israel. Out of that four, we all grew up in a Zionistic home, by the way. Out of that four, there are those who would only live in Jerusalem, would never leave Jerusalem. There are those who would live in Tel Aviv and would never live in Jerusalem. There are others who have stayed in the United Kingdom, pray religiously to, towards Jerusalem, but would never move to the state of Israel. And there's one who lives in Brooklyn who thinks it's Jerusalem, right? So we have this whole gamut of viewpoints and gamut of ideas. There are some who are willing to live in accordance with those ideas, and there are others who look at other pragmatic considerations. They have a job, they have a career, they have a social life over in the United Kingdom. They're not moving anywhere. And I think that it's absurd to suggest that such variance doesn't exist among the Palestinians. Yes, but by the way, I, no. I, I'm sure you understand yeah. that I agree 100% with what you're saying. I could say every single time, a portion of the Palestinians. Right. I could say, I say often, we're talking about a Palestinian leadership which has at the moment control. Right. control. Mm -hmm. Of course I know that there is wide disparity of opinion in the Jewish community. And I think you're wrong if you tell me there's no Israelis who would give up East Jerusalem. Oh, no, there are plenty of them, There are plenty. plenty okay. of them. And I, I'm oh. not suggesting the Palestinians are monolithic right. people. Right. I am saying at the moment there are movements. Mm -hmm. And what you were saying to me was, even though you know there are some Israelis who would give up Jerusalem, your sense is that the overwhelming majority, the, the mood of the, is Jewish, the, the Israeli Jew, is not to give up Jerusalem. And I understood that's what you meant. And so if I don't say it as distinctly, understand, I, un I recognize that there is a, a range of opinion in every community. What I'm talking about is, where's the major thrust? And at the moment, diplomatically, diplomatically, the major thrust is a Palestinian community is saying to the Jews, you took my land, and I'm not going to make a compromise with you. And Western Europe mm -hmm. validates that position. And there are those in the United States who validate the position. And you have been one of the champions fighting the BDS movement and the vilification of the state of Israel. And that's my concern. And I, I agree with you, and I know that you understand and appreciate the complexities of a people. I want that to be clear. It's known to me. But what needs to be known to the viewers is that there are two Israelis here, a general and a mere sergeant. Okay? And we see that there's nuance. In other words, we don't look at them in one way. Your viewers need to hear that, because I think sometimes people expect that actually we do view it in okay. one way. And tell, That's me, why the, I tell say. me you see the nuance in the Palestinian leadership as well. I think personally the Palestinian leadership, the diplomatic echelons that you spoke about, I think they're on borrowed time. And I think that there is nothing that supports the notion of borrowed time more clearly than the absence of action when mm -hmm. the call to arms came that I alluded mm -hmm. to in the previous mm -hmm. show around Jerusalem. Yes. By the way, I Very think significant. Of, yes, I think of all the things you've said, it's the most heartening. Wonderful, cause, because we should be heartened by these things. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the point about to whom have we presented this. So... We have presented this to members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. We pre presented it to members of the United States Congress. We presented it to legislative staffers in that context on a bicameral, uh, bipartisan basis. The room was overflowing, and it was extremely well received. We have also presented this to leading, leading academic institutions at the graduate and doctoral level in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Germany. We've presented it to members of the British Parliament. We've also presented it to members of the British House of Lords. Last week, we presented it to the Secretary of State for the Chancellery of the Prime Minister of Poland. They want to call an international conference around this idea. There's an appetite for this, and I want to explain why there's an appetite, and then we can perhaps talk about some of the distinct advantages. But without speaking to, this all is a little bit vacuous. And, and it's important that we get to that. The reason that there is an appetite for it is there is an entire 
generation who is not like you and is not even like me. They did not grow up. I only caught the tail end. They did not grow up on Oslo. They did not witness the seminal events of Yitzhak Rabin shaking the hands with Yasser Arafat. And when they are told, and sometimes, by the way, even berated into acknowledging that there's a movement afoot, but it just happened to have occurred in 1993 and 1995, this has all of the resonance of if we were to tell that same generation that they should discard their iPhone and revert to Polaroid cameras. This is, this is completely obsolete in their memory, literally in their memory. Now, what is not obsolete, however, and what is very much at play is that there is an ongoing conflict between Israelis and the Palestinians. And what is gaining traction is two things. Number one, a complete despondence, despondence about the virtue of the two-state solution because it hasn't moved. It simply hasn't moved. And a growing adherence, support for, and suggestion of the one-state solution. And, and I think that the new state solution is vital because what it does to that generation the students of today, by the way, are the policy makers of tomorrow. When you get to these graduate schools, some of them have run for office, and many of them declare that they're going to run for office again or for the first time. They are seeking an idea that gives two states for two peoples who can live side by side. And as the general said, they don't really take too much of an interest in where you draw that out. What they want to see is a true, true state for the Palestinian Arabs. This offers a state for the Palestinian Arabs. It merely asks that we imagine the lines anew along which these two states would be drawn out. Now, as I said at the outset, it's imperfect. It's in need of certain refinement. But it is an enormous upgrade from what's currently on the table by virtue of nothing else than it's offering a state, incidentally. It does not call for anything less than what is currently held by the Palestinian Arabs. It merely improves the situation, and that's why it's being received so well on your academic institutions here in the United States of America. They are ripe for a new idea. When you spoke to Congress, did you receive any positive feedback? Extremely positive, Mark. Is there someone who would talk to me from Congress Yes. and say, I'm in favor of the new state solution? Yes, yes. I want to hear yes. a United States senator say to me, you know, I was presented with the new state solution, and that really excites me. I want to hear that. I want to hear a congressman say to me, you know, I was at a meeting with uh, you know, Amir and to, you know, Benjamin, and he, they, they have this idea. It, it's way overdue. It's fabulous. It's perfect time. The whole situation has changed in the, in the Arab world. The new state solution is for me. I want to hear somebody say that I can, to me. I'm confident that I can bring that to the table, and by the way. I'll do that on the phone even. Okay. Yes. I think that I can do that. Okay. And not only that, they also didn't just hear from the General Abivi and myself. There were five generals that are briefing on this. A very, very different, including, incidentally, the general who commanded the withdrawal from the Gaza Strip. Can you, you ever can get hit by the way in our side. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would, I would bring you whomever you're willing to grant audience to, and I applaud you for being open to that. So, yes, there are. They have received it very, very, po not, again, not without questions. What are their questions? They ask questions. I'll, I'll tell you what one of the questions is. One of the questions is, and, and this is a consequence of the good work that's and, and been Do they ever ask my question? Yes, yes, yes. They oh. ask a myriad of questions, yeah. and including yours, but not restricted to, to yes. the ones that you've been able to ask thus far. So I'll give you an example. Due to the good and diligent work undertaken up on the hill by other organizations, one of the primary questions that's asked is, is this defensible for the State of Israel? Okay. Now, General Avivi, I would like to speak to that. The answer is yes. Not only is it defensible, it's infinitely preferable to the two-state solution, and, and I'd like the General to talk to it. And they also speak to the idea of forced transfer. They ask, do you really mean no forced transfer? And we say, we really mean mm -hmm. no forced mm -hmm. transfer. Mm -hmm. They also speak to the idea of the right of return, and we say that they would have an open migration policy, we would not have fixed it. To the new state. To the new state. state. It's an independent state. It's absurd for the state of Israel to so say, we will now control your migration policy. So they ask these questions, but they ask them because they've seen and been educated about the two state, and they've seen it's not gone anywhere, and they are waiting for okay. new ideas. Democrats and Republicans? Absolutely. 
Yes, Democrats and Republicans. Yes. I think it's amazing to see that this idea appeals to all the political spectrum. It's not an idea that you would say it's right wing or left wing or center. It's just a good idea. And everybody can relate to it. Okay, I want to be wrong. I love your idea for Israel. I, don't, I just, it flies from me in the face of everything I think I know about the Palestinian world. And I'm not talking about now the fact that there aren't Palestinians who really don't want to be. You know, I'm, I'm in an Israeli hospital. I'm being taken care of by Palestinians. I got Palestinians mm -hmm. who are waiting for their mother to be taken care of. In it, in it by, they're lovely people. and They drive me home from the hospital. But it's not about individuals. But there is a, I say again, there is a, a certainly an experience here where the experience is that there have been opportunities for at least dialogue. And they've been rejected. And Khartoum was a transformative event in the history of the Middle East, where after the Six-Day War, I've got people saying to me, you know, what? Israel missed an opportunity at the end of the Six-Day War. They could have said to the, to the Arab world, you know, you can have this land if we just make peace. I said, that's what they said. Within a month, it was in the end of August, Levi Eshkol says, what? With, except for Jerusalem, by the way, and some other defensive changes, you can have, it's not you can have back, you can have what was then the West Bank, but you've got to recognize us, negotiate the borders, and make peace with us. And, they, and the Arab League goes to Khartoum and says, no, no, no. And from my perspective, as sad as it is, this is a human tragedy, that has been the formal Palestinian position from 1967, really, from the 20s, right down to today. So your plan works if there can be a sea change. There's no sea change needed in the, in the Jewish world. All of it, we get everything we want. Mark, the Palestinian long, long has to give up everything he's been making an issue over since the Grand Mufti began this nonsense in the first part of the 20th century. I think that long before we're talking about implementation, just the idea itself is huge news. First, of, be, all, first right. of all, bringing the Jewish people in Israel and in diaspora to support one reasonable solution that everybody can, can accept. This is a big deal. You're right. The only people who have to agree are the Palestinians. Yes, but before that, they're they are not agreeing to anything at the moment. So first of all, strategically speaking, and talking about Israeli uh, relationship with the world, time has come for the state of Israel to come up with a reasonable solution. And this is a reasonable solution. And be the one that is taking the initiative in, in their hands, an initiative that the United States can accept, an initiative that Europe can accept, by the way, an initiative that the Arab Sunni world can accept, us, the Jewish people, can accept. That's important. And this is a huge, huge deal. Now, right. If they want to be the party of no, let them be the party of no. Okay. I want to make sure you get a chance to say anything you want about <laughs> this plan. Sure. Okay? And because every time you're about to say it, I've got another question. So now... Say anything you think it's important for us to hear. And remember, we've seen the video. Yes. So yes. What, what do you want to say that in some way supplements the video? Well, first of all, it's, it's not 1967 anymore. That's the first thing that I want to say. We're See, we always, we all, I, I, you always get sidetracked. No, <laughs> it's vital what you're saying. Okay. You're, you, because you've seen all of this, you've watched all of this. I give credence to what your assessments are, but it's not the same world today. I'll give you a simple example, and then I'll talk to the virtues of the plan. Okay. The simple fact of the matter is that an underemployed or unemployed populace within the Arab world has shown its leaders that if they are not attended to, those leaders, the leaders who you say are obdurate and obstructionist and will never go for this, they may very well be deposed. That is a real, real outcome of the Arab Spring. We saw it. A lot of people looked at the Arab Spring and said, you know, these people, 
They're, they're looking for democracy. They weren't looking for democracy. They were looking for jobs. They were looking for economic viability. Now, you have a massive underemployment issue in the Gaza Strip. You have less than adequate employment in the West Bank. It's improved, but it's not where it should be. The reality of the matter is that a restive, young, underemployed population puts the leadership on even more borrowed time. It's a borrowed, borrowed timeline in which they are playing, and I predict that that will uh, detonate with before too long. The second thing is you have, as General Habibi said, the Sunni Arab world looking at this issue differently. This is not a situation where it's within their interest to perpetuate the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, rather to resolve it. When you have that, and when you have people like the, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia saying, guys, let's move beyond this, take what's given to you, and so on and so forth, that is indicative of something far broader that's taking place, perhaps not always articulated, but absolutely a sea change, certainly different from 1967. The other thing is this. The Palestinians, it's not correct to say that they were fighting just for Jerusalem and they wanted just Ramallah and they wanted just Haifa and just... They also wanted something else, less tangible but no less important, which is the notion of self-determination, and it's never, ever been offered. And that has to be taken into consideration as one of the reasons as to why nothing has progressed. Now, what we are offering is true self-determination. We are basically offering the Palestinian Arabs, by way of the new state solution, the occasion, opportunity, and the moment in history to establish a state for themselves, built and fashioned in the image that they imagined for themselves and for their peoples. And I want to explain why it's of importance that this be given due credence. Number one, 50% of the issue is in the Gaza Strip. 50% of the issue has nothing whatsoever right now, geographically, to do with Judea and Samaria or the West Bank. You bring about the new state solution, you've solved 50% of the issue. That's a significant percentage, if you take it as approximate splits of the peoples. Number two, it's an independent, sovereign, thriving, and viable state. Number three, it is in a part of the land which they claim for themselves, not dissimilar to what the State of Israel did when first it came about. It wasn't all of the land that the Jewish people claimed as being theirs. It was in a part of the land. Beyond all of that, it gives them the opportunity for this economic viability because unlike a landlocked, a landlocked West Bank state for the Palestinian Arabs, they have a shoreline. That shoreline opens it to industries that they have proven themselves masters of for millennia. I'm talking about trade, import, export, commerce, hospitality. They can build a shoreline that will be the predicate for a booming economy. Not only that, it marries a ready works force, this underemployed members of the Gazan population, with a ready works program, the building up of the homes, the towns, the cities that we spoke about. That is absent the two-state paradigm. Much of the Palestinian economy at the moment is built upon Palestinian Arabs who cross into Judea and Samaria, build homes in which Israelis will live, and then cross back into wherever it is uh, that they initially crossed in from. That's not the same here. They will be building homes in their image. And it also, by the way, absolutely traces the history of the establishment and the building up of the Jewish state. There are many, many advantages to this. Egypt has interests at play. We haven't spoken about the Egyptian interests. Those interests in short order are economic interest, security interest. They have a massive issue in the Sinai Peninsula that I assure you they would rather be rid of. Israel can help with that. And also hegemony or status astride the international community. They've been deposed and downgraded. So when you look at this, what you see is the offering for a new beginning for the Palestinian Arabs. And I remind you that those who wish to stay in Judea and Samaria, they don't have to go anywhere. But you cannot and you must not turn away from what's going on in the Gaza Strip because the Gaza Strip is a ticking time bomb it will only become more complex the more we avert our gaze to an idea that belongs to generations past, such as the two-state solution. And there are three points about this that I'll conclude with. Point number one, right now, at this particular time, there is a different administration. That administration sees things very, very differently. I don't want to go into the ins and outs of all of that, but I can tell you that it does not endorse 
this particular time, the two-state solution paradigm. It's looking for new ideas, and you can see in the press that they're speaking much more about the Gaza Strip as being the solution. It, we shouldn't miss that opportunity. Number two, we see this growing generation of future legislators who I'm very, very concerned will not find favor in the story of the State of Israel on one particular side of the aisle. That's perhaps a different subject. But the State of Israel must do what General Avivi said. We must put forward a viable plan that if implemented, we can live with. And if rejected, it's clear who's the party of no. And number three, and finally, there needs to be a plan on the table that brings together the large swaths of the Jewish community in the diaspora and the Jewish people in the state of Israel and says towards there is where we want to go. At the moment that is absent, it needs to be put there because if we don't put it there, we're going to end up with disparate communities, a Jewish people in the state of Israel and a diaspora and they will forever be talking past each okay. other. Will the Palestinians who decide to stay on what we now call the West Bank, will they have citizenship? What is good about our idea that it solves the main issue really for, for the Israelis and for the Palestinians. And the main issue for the Israelis, Israel doesn't want two more a million a Palestinian citizens, Israeli. I just want, do they get citizenship or not? So they get Palestinian citizenship. They will be citizens of their own state, proud citizens of their own state. And then there is many different ways in which uh, we can build their governance in the ways already, the place they already control in, uh, in uh, Judea and Samaria. They continue living. They can have autonomy. It can be completely autonomous. How is that be, different than what it is now? It's, it's very different, and I'll explain why. Because if you want to anchor the solution in uh, Judea and Samaria, then you are thinking all the time how to enlarge the area of control of the Palestinians in order to create some kind of viability. Now there is a limit to how much you can enlarge it. And then you have the Jordan River which is controlled by Israel and you have Israeli towns. There is no viability to this idea. So what we are doing is we are anchoring the solution in Gaza into the Sinai Peninsula which is a huge, huge area. The Sinai Peninsula is 60 thousand kilometers squared. Gaza and Judea and Samaria together it's less than six thousand. It's one tenth of that. We're not taking anything the Palestinians already have. We're suggesting for the world to give them an area at least, I'm saying at least, it can be much much bigger than that, but at least as big as Judea okay. and Samaria. I want to make sure I understand. Right now there are there are areas there's area A, area B, area C, and the Palestinians have autonomy and control, except for the fact that the IDF can go in to a, any Arab village or city it wants to if it feels that there's a security threat. But the Palestinian has their own schools, hospitals, police force, newspapers, television, everything. And they are autonomous to the extent to which they want to be. But they don't have Israeli citizenship. And again, the Peter Beinerts here in America say that is moving Israel towards apartheid. It's not, but that's the rhetoric that's used. But what he does say is you have Palestinians living under Israeli control who do not have Israeli citizenship. I now hear that your new state solution Ramallah will stay. Nablus will stay. They'll live the same way they're living now. But you're going to give them a passport, a citizenship document for this new state along the coast of Gaza. That's the really the only difference. Do I have it right? This is a huge difference. Because I tell you why. Because when people talk about uh, the people in Judea and Samaria being part of Israel, they're saying correctly that in the long term, if this is the situation, they need to have Israeli citizenship, which Israel, rightly so, doesn't want to give them because Israel wants to be a Jewish state. So they can't stay without citizenship. They need a citizenship like any other person. So we're talking, first of all, of a solution that is done by agreement. 
And by agreement, we are talking about something that has, is very easy to implement according, according to international law, is having a Palestinian state, a viable, large, big, contiguous Palestinian state in Gaza and the Sinai Peninsula. And they will have also an autonomy, as it is today, in the West Bank. These people will be citizens of their own state. It's much like in Europe, an Italian can move to Germany. He can live all his life in Germany. He can be a German resident. He will always choose the government in his own state, in Italy. So it's easy to understand. It's done in Europe. Why, By you know, the way, why, it's why a, of course, it's not apartheid, that what the generals just described about Europe. And not only that, Mark, we're not offering them in return for this idea a passport. A passport is to reduce it down to you know, the, the least significant of all things, in, in my opinion. What we're offering, just to absolutely hammer away at this, we're offering them a state. It's not a passport. It's a state. It's a state that they can live in. At the moment, Beinart's objection is not necessarily that they're under Israeli control. Beinart's objection is they're stateless. If you have a state and it's ratified and recognized, many of these issues go away. And I would suggest to Peter Beinart, who's not here, to, to volley back and forth, although I would welcome that as well, by the way, that it would be very, very difficult were the Egyptians to say we endorse this and were the Saudis to say we endorse it and were the Palestinian people to say we endorse it, for Peter Bayer not to say, I'm sorry, I, I'm more Palestinian than the Palestinians and I don't endorse it. I think actually most of his arguments I, would absolutely. go away. Uh, who controls water rights? Well, I believe that we we'll have to reach an agreement that, I mean, I mean th this area is small, and the infrastructure is really one. So Israel would have to be in charge, first of all, of security. Then uh, I think there, there, there will have to be some arrangement where you can develop infrastructure mutually. I'm talking about roads. The situation of the roads today in the West Bank is terrible. It's done in a very bad way. Electricity is there, or anyway Israeli, water. Israeli, we are desalinating water and we are going, by the way, in this plan to help build desaliation, huge desaliation plants in the coast of the Sinai Peninsula and assist dramatically Egypt and uh, this new state in flourishing the, the desert. The thing the Israelis know how to do best. Okay. I'm running out of time. I want to ask you this question. You've told me you've had some success in the British Parliament, in Poland, and in the United States government. What kind of success have you had inside Israel itself? Very important question. Thank you for asking it. So there was a cabinet minister who floated the idea. This minister is not an individual who, whose expertise lay in this area at all. They did so in a, a very casual fashion not attaching any real professionalism or analysis to it. And they then turned, after there was a bit of an uproar, back to us to ask us to help them by furnishing the, the details that, that ought to have been there in advance of unveiling the plan. So the point about that little anecdote is that there are people in the cabinet who are aware of it. Now, the next phase is that we will actually be briefing uh, members of the government of the states of Israel and the opposition uh, in the Knesset in the states of Israel beginning this November. Don't in tell me what happens. Before I tell you what happens at, the, at that moment, I want to tell you why we're doing it in that way, just in, in short form, if I may. We believe a couple of things are needed to make peoples and leaders turn brave. So first of all, the Israeli people. The Israeli people, which is a tremendous people, feels confident when it feels safe and secure. You've heard that many, many times. The people to whom they look for the feeling of safety and security are their generals. That's why we have a bank of experts that is heavily leaning towards generals. Now, the leadership of the state of Israel tends to turn brave. And I'm not speaking about an individual. I'm talking about across the span. They tend to turn brave when they feel that there is support from the international community primarily, though not exclusively, from the United States of America. It's for that reason that we have brought support for the idea from the international community. It's not an arbitrary step. And we can now go to the Israelis and go to the government and go to the opposition and say to them, 
if you support this plan, if you move for this plan, you will have the support of these various international bodies and international organizations and governments. So that's the next step, and I would be very, very happy to, uh, to, to let you know how that goes. But I'm confident and I'm optimistic. Colleague about you. Thank you very Mazal. much for hosting us. Are you kidding? I wish you every success. You're wonderful. Thank you. And look, you may be able to do a breakthrough that we haven't had, and then there'll be more than Kola Kavod. And I hope you always come back and we'll talk and get to know each other more and more. Thank you very okay? much. Thank you so much. And you, Thank my you dear very friend, much, Mark. no one like you. You're the best in the world. <laughs> Thank and you I, very much. My only problem is I have a million other things, uh, not about the, two, the new state solution, that I wish we had time to do. I'm always you, available. You have to be no. here as much as you possibly can. It's my honor. But Kola Kavod to you, too. You know, Kol tuva both of you. Thank you very much. It should only be that, that you have tapped into something that will make a real change for the good of everyone, of everyone. And the, the nice plan, what you're doing is you're not only helping Israel, you're helping the Palestinians and you're helping the world. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed. And the one thing you're going to do is you're going to, we're going to pursue this. I would because for many that. people yes. on JBS, yes. they're hearing this for the first this time. This should just be an introduction. Perfect. Absolutely. Okay? Yep. So, you, you, you'll hold my hand step by step. We'll see where this goes. I'd be honored. I'd be honored. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very much. I'll say it again. The thoughts of two remarkable individuals, each of them are making a transcending contribution to the state of Israel and the Jewish people. Benjamin Anthony, founder of Our Soldiers Speak, I wish we had more time to talk about that. And also now of the new state solution. And Amir Avivi, who is principal officer of the new state solution. And obviously he brings a long storied career as a general in the IDF. I hope you've enjoyed hearing what both of them had to say as we, all of us here, want only one thing. There should be peace throughout the world. But right now, for us, we want peace for the state of Israel, and we want it for the Palestinian people. There should, there should be an end to this conflict. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any of your reactions to any of the things you've heard discussed here on this edition of L'Chaim. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I'd love to read some of your thoughts to what you've heard on this edition of L'Chaim on JBS. Until the next time. I'm Mark Golub, the Chaim, my friends, to life. of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.